so this is your sort of third, well, fourth borough themed novel because you have two Brooklyn novels. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to write about each of the different boroughs? You know, what sort of frame of mind you're in when you're writing them and how you maybe feel afterwards? Um, that's, that's a great question. I, I don't think of it, of course, as a tour of the boroughs. Um, but I realize that I'm ending up in that situation. <laughs> um, Brooklyn is a whole other uh, situation for me. And in fact, even before Motherless Brooklyn, the first of the two obvious Brooklyn books, the, the first chapter of the novel that precedes all this New York writing, uh, it's a book called uh, Girl in Landscape, is also set in uh, Brooklyn. I think the family lives in Brooklyn Heights, but they take, you know, kind of a futuristic uh, subway train to Coney Island um, before the book goes off to other worlds. And, um, and there are short stories that, that precede this work. I mean, Brooklyn is my organic subject matter. <laughs> and so um, I'll, probably, uh, I'll probably be back to Brooklyn before uh, I can conceive of something to say about the Bronx or Staten Island. <laughs> um, actually, today I was on the FDR and I thought, maybe I'll do a Roosevelt Island novel. <laughs> um, and so anything outside of Brooklyn is a kind of leap. Mm -hmm. But then again, to, to write about Brooklyn as I knew it growing up, you know, I grew up, well, very near here, three subway stops, or that was how I counted it, because I was counting from Hoyt Skirmhorn, three subway stops from, uh, from Manhattan, and very much oriented. I mean, the whole world is oriented towards Manhattan. When you're in uh, Brooklyn, and in that time, um, before uh, the, the, the Renaissance, uh, <laughs> um, in the Dark Ages, um, you know, and, and, and also with my parents, my father had come to, to New York City to go to Columbia and to, to try to exhibit his art in Manhattan galleries. My, my mother was from Queens, but ran away to Greenwich Village. They, you know, I was, I was actually born in Manhattan. I feel very betraying saying that, but I was born in uh, St. Vincent's Hospital. So my parents' first home when I was born was an illegal loft on West Broadway. And the, the life we lived in Brooklyn, like a lot of people's, was, you know, you didn't ignore the presence of Manhattan, right? <laughs> it was this golden place that you, were, you participated in even as you were sort of exiled from it or at a remove. So this doubleness, you know, when I say that my organic subject is Brooklyn, it contains its implicit relationship to, you know, to be from the outer boroughs is to be pointed in some ambivalent, charged way towards the, you know, the, the, big, the big city. And to feel that you, it belongs to you and it doesn't. To be possessed and dispossessed of the legacy of New York at the same time. Um, Queens, uh, for this book, well, you know, Queens fell into my lap by dint of my grandmother. And I, and, and, you know, I have a certain claim there. And I'm also transposing, obviously, when I do, like, the coming of age of the, uh, the, the character Miriam, you know, who's approximately my mother's generation of, of Queens native. Uh, I'm transposing that experience that I wrote about so directly in Fortress of Solitude of being an outer borough kid but wanting to propel myself into the big city. And I'm just turning it into a queen story, you know, but the way I related to it came out of my own feeling. Um, I, all I'd ever did in, in the, the Bronx was soccer practice. Uh, <laughs> and I, did, I wasn't a very good soccer player. Um, I, I remember one, well, there was this one day in high school where, um, you know, I went to high school at Music and Art in Manhattan. So every day I would uh, take the train from Brooklyn to Manhattan, which is, you know, it's your world sort of suddenly explodes when you move out of the orbit of your local uh, public school. And I, it wasn't like I'd never gone to Manhattan. My parents did have this relationship. We'd go to galleries or to Chinatown for food. But to suddenly get on the subway every day and make Manhattan my own was really big. And there was this one day when I was on the music and art soccer team, and I went all the way up to that park. Is it Van Cortland Park? Yeah. And, um, and practice soccer. And that night, some friends of ours who'd moved quite courageously and bizarrely from Vanderbilt Avenue in Brooklyn to 
what was meant to be the next gent gentrification in Staten Island, right <laughs> near the ferry. And so I went from Brooklyn to Manhattan. I practiced soccer all afternoon in, in, in Van Cortlandt Park and then took the subway all the way down to South Ferry and took the ferry to Staten Island. And I thought, I should go spend the night at my grandmother's tonight. <laughs> and I'll have been in all five boroughs for, you know, for a reason in the same day. Uh, but, you know, my claim expands from Borum Hill. You know, it's Dean Street and then, and then uh, Borum Hill and then I, I, you know, Manhattan became um, something I could, I could think about starting in high school and start to make my own. But it's not the same thing. But what is the, the sort of fictional sort of mentality of a man, like Chronic City, a Manhattan novel. Like, do you, do you, you know, since you're writing about these different boroughs of New mm -hmm. York, uh, you know, in, in, in a way, they each have a different character at, in your imagination. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Fortress of Solitude and this new one are very much novels about uh, the past and entrenchment in legacies, both happy and unhappy legacies of uh, the immigrant lives led in the outer boroughs and the, the, the real history of the city and the way that it, it clings. And I think in some ways that's how I feel about Brooklyn and Queens, that the past is still everywhere. I mean, this theater is like a great allegory of it, that somehow Brooklyn, I've said this before, but that Brooklyn uh, is always stuck halfway. It's gentrifiable almost. And then you still end up with these chunks of older realities just, you know, in front of you very tangible. For me, I feel they're very tangible. Uh, and Manhattan is a place that actually succeeds in transforming. It's, you know, the Disney version of Times Square totally eradicates the Times Square I knew in the 70s as a kid. And that's, in a way, what the idea of Manhattan is. It's about the, the, the idea of the future, a city that's f designed by commerce, not, it has, it's not designed by history or by uh, ethnicity or religion. It's the first secular city and it's the first commercial city. So Chronic City was a kind of portrait of, of, of Manhattan um, where I exaggerated this property of it being a, a place that uh, destroyed the past, mm -hmm. that was amnesiac in its ferocity. And so it's, it's a very different book from the Queen's book and the Brooklyn book because it's, it's a book about the present. Now, I transformed that present in various sort of, I don't know, allegorical ways. But, you know, that's really a book about 2004, mm. which is when I started writing it, and how I felt about the life of New York City and the life of Manhattan at that moment in what turned out to be kind of the brief golden you know, boom between two disasters, between 9-11 and the financial catastrophe. And right in the middle, there was this pretense that everything was great again, that seemed to me kind of magnificent and horrible in a way that totally exemplified Manhattan's powers. And so I wanted to capture that feeling. Um, so it's a, that's a book about the present, and the other two are books so much uh, mired in, in, in histories. Yeah. Well, it seems that in um, in Motherless Brooklyn and, and Fortress of Solitude, um, Brooklyn really feels like home. And um, you have, um, now with Dissident Gardens, you have Queens, but it's not exactly like Brooklyn. And in fact, um, a lot of the characters are, are in Queens because they couldn't, they refused to something else. Yeah. So you have a character who was a, one of the first black policemen and he gets promotion, but, but, but in order to do that, he has to do things that mean that he doesn't want to live in Harlem anymore. And, um, and Rose, the main character who's obviously inspired by her grandmother, um, <clears throat> she, you know, she's in the <laughs> Communist Party with her husband and he wants her to go live on this horrible a Jewish communal farm and like a basically a kibbutz right. in, in New, New Jersey, Jersey. Yeah. and it's <laughs> populated by all these people who have no idea what they're doing it's sort of this idealization of the um, agrarian lifestyle and and um, and so she says no which is a big deal because 
she and her husband are supposed to do whatever the party tells them to do, and she realizes that the party has instructed him to do this. And, and so she says, I'm not going to do that, but we can go to Queens, yeah. <laughs> to Sunnyside Gardens. Right. Um, which she says is a sort of utopian it's yeah. sort of an alternative. It's like a farm in the city. Um, but, but, but the son of this black cop at one point, or maybe it's the cop himself, um, is, is, he's thinking about what his father says. Um, it describes um, an ache in the whole neighborhood to be over there instead. Uh-huh. And, and that seemed almost like the role that poor Queens has in yeah. this novel. Well, okay. So, so this is really, to me, this is very compelling, and it's to do with real histories of how the city is constructed. The difference between Brooklyn and Queens, um, you know, superficially, you might think, okay, so there are these two giant bedroom community zones for Manhattan, but that's, that's a falsehood. Mm-hmm. Brooklyn was a rival city that was uh, co-opted and annexed. It had its own identity, its own uh, economic engines, its own civic center, which we live very near. And, I mean, you can actually see this even in the, the grid of the subway system. You know, the way all the lines come to Borough Hall or Nevin Street or, you know, to within this very small area. Um, Brooklyn was a rival city. And in fact, it was, you know, if you look into the um, election, the, the city was asked... The, uh, the residents of Brooklyn were asked to vote as to whether they wanted to join up with Greater New York, with be annexed, and the vote was like within a few hundred votes, and it was probably fixed. Mm. Um, so there's this very powerful, disenfranchised, wounded pride. Brooklyn was, uh, you know, maybe never as as uh, as big a place as. New York City, but it was its own place, and it was a rival place, and then it was kind of uh, turned into a borough. And it's older. Um, Queens is something else entirely. Queens is uh, a, a suburban plan. Queens has a very different kind of indignity in relationship to, to Greater New York, in that it was just basically mapped out as a place for the mm. uh, you know, the workers who needed to come to Manhattan to make this great economic, you know, uh, colossus, you know, to clean the, the janitors and to clean the, the, the corridors and the, the, well, and the policemen to police the neighborhoods and so forth. Queens was sort of designed to be the bedroom, the gigantic bedroom community. And, you know, this is um, also reproduced in the history of the subway. A lot of the stops on the Queens lines um, if you look at the early development of, you know, the, the F train as it moves through Queens or the 7, uh, those subway stations were plotted when that was farmland. And they, they basically, the, the community arose around the subway stop. They designed a series of, so they're very evenly spaced, and it's just, you know, someone looking at the map and probably some developers making a tremendous amount of money because they'd already gone in and bought up the farmland. And it was sort of like, people are going to live here. So the subway will stop here and here and here and here, and then the businesses come. But there's no civic center and no legacy in the same way. So the, the sense of identity, I think, is really, really radically different. The, you know, the kind of chip on the shoulder that you can have yeah. from Queens is an other thing yeah. uh, than the sort of um, disgruntled pride that, that comes from Brooklyn identity. Yeah. Well, what about um, Sunnyside Gardens, which I, at, at first I thought was um, what the book takes its name from, but there is actually another dissident yeah. gardens in, in the novel, which I won't spoil, but, um, but uh, you know, I guess when you characterize Queens that way, it doesn't seem like a likely place that someone with a sort of utopian mm. Impulse would want to set yeah. up a. Well, the those blocks and there's there's a real Sunnyside Gardens and it's it's a really specific uh, architectural and and urban planning, um, you know, uh, site that's still alive uh, was was a plan uh, that was, you know, I guess you'd say kind of socialist tinged. It was Lewis Mumford and Eleanor Roosevelt and in the time when Queens represented all these kind of potentials because it was just, it was going to be 
a part of the city, but it was still being mapped out in that way that I just described. Um, someone said, well, this is, what a city, this is what a city really should be like. It, you know, it wasn't Jane Jacobs, but it was a Jane Jacobs kind of thinking that went into making these blocks that were uh, houses, you know, modest but autonomous homes that could be bought by, uh, you know, uh, the middle class or lower middle class workers and give them a sense of autonomy and pride, but that would be built around um, blocks that were sort of turned inside out. Uh, they, were, they weren't front yards, and they weren't backyards in the sense that we're accustomed to them here. There was a giant communal space that was uh, open to the public at one end and the other, and people farmed in, inside the block, and people uh, congregated and shared this space, um, and, and it attracted people who ranged from, uh, you know, um, well, the, the, the just sort of um, communitarian-minded idealists of the early 20th century American life who were who not, you know, not radicals by their own self-definition, certainly not revolutionaries, and it also attracted revolutionaries because they saw this and they were like, fantastic, you know, and it's affordable and symp simpatico and people are moving there, and so it became a bit of a hotbed, and um, in a way that obviously Eleanor Roosevelt wouldn't have necessarily been um, intending. <laughs> and uh, it struck me that those blocks were this kind of tragic, beautiful embodiment of, you know, a kind of lost utopian idea about the commons. Because if you go to um, walk around the Sunnyside Gardens blocks now, they've mostly been gated at either end, so they're not public spaces for non-residents anymore. And inside them, if you climb over the gate, as I was doing when I was researching the book, um, <laughs> what you find is that these once communal spaces have been sort of balkanized bit by bit into conventional backyards, and someone will put up a little fence and plop their, you know, uh, their grill there. And, 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 but you can see on the ground literally the evidence of the pathways that once rambled through common areas, and it's just sort of like... Uh, you know, uh, there's that um, philosophical concept, the prisoner's dilemma. It's like once someone claims a portion of it for themselves, everyone's like, oh, oh, it's not everybody's? I guess I better get mine. Yeah. And so it's a collapse of a commons in plain view right there. Uh, I, uh, I was reading a, a New Yorker story about the refugee camps, Syrian refugees, and the guy who was running the camp said, people hate communal things. Uh -huh. Every time we put one up, they take it all apart. And, uh, and I thought of Rose, your main uh -huh. character, who goes there and who has this sort of dream. She she's, starts out as a member of the Communist Party, yeah. and she kind of gets her husband into hot water with them by refusing to go to the farm in New Jersey. And then the book opens with her being kicked out of the Communist Party yeah. for having an affair with a black cop. Um, could you talk a little bit about her? And I know that she was inspired by her grandmother yeah. and, and about that sort of, I think that the, the sort of dream, the utopian dream of, of communism and it, this is, it's such a fascinating relationship that Rose and then her daughter Miriam have to this ideal. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think uh, I learned so many contradictory things about <laughs> the American left growing up and they, they entered my body, you know, just in this intuitive way. And then when I began to think, I better sort this all out and research it, everything I learned was, was as contradictory as my intuitions. It was an impossible history. Yeah. It, it just could, was, you know, it's, it's total failure and it's total success in so many different ways. And, yeah. and the way that its legacies get folded in, you know, any, any success gets claimed by the kind of liberal center. Mm. Uh, so that it didn't happen, and anything ridiculous and 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 tragic or or misguided becomes uh, the only trail that you can you can discover. It's 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 it only exists to be discredited, yeah. in, right? The American communist movement, but the paradoxes are so uh, tormenting and 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 to to think about because it extends really from the American experiment. And yet, it's also something about the nature of the ex American experiment that makes our country the least viable place for a communist party, you know, much less than a, a European 
country because of our uh, obsession with, you know, the different variations on freedom um, and individualism, and also because of this sort of expansionist myth. It's like, you know, um, I, I, and I, one of the one of the tensions in the book is between the. Um, you know, typical 1930s kind of Dust Bowl, Woody Guthrie, sentimentalization of the farms and the agrarian life, when in fact, of course, the future of those kinds of sentiments is totally urban. You know, it which points towards cities. Yeah. And farmers, farmers did not really want to be socialized <laughs> <laughs> at any point. Um, but they still were this emblem of, you know, like yeah. the good life and... Uh, I just, I was, I was so puzzled by all of this. And um, so I just tried to make the characters vehicles for all of this baffling information. And um, more, th more even than information, just the sense of yearning. Because it really isn't even about histories. Uh, ultimately, it's about just the way, uh, for me, you know, when I think about my grandmother and I think about myself, I just think about, uh, the way um, a yearning to have things be transformed uh, becomes tantalized by these ideologies or movements or, or um, assertions. And, and, and the way that, that yearning just finally, you know, tries to fit itself in to all these things and then it also just falls out and it's yeah. still there we're still walking around wishing for another world. Well, this was, you know, a moment when suddenly everyone thought they were having the exact same wish for another world. And then what do you do 10 years, 30 years, 50 years after you've, you've made that uh, beautiful mistake, <laughs> right? Well, one of the things Rose says is that um, communists always end up alone, which is such a self-controversy, yeah. self-contradicting thing. But actually, I would like you to talk a little bit about your grandmother. I sure. mean, I assume that's yeah. your avenue into this, yeah. this, uh, uh, this character, and, and what was her, yeah. her relationship to all of these? Well, you know, I only knew my grandmother as a kid, and, and I knew her, you know, uh, in the very late 60s and through the 70s, and I what I knew was that she was this like incredibly dynamic, intellectually ferocious, uh, secular, um, firebrand. But her, uh, the center of her operation seemed to me veiled. She was like a dark area. It was like a big secret that couldn't be glimpsed. Oh. And it, instead it had split itself off into these bizarre, uh, passions for solving like very tiny local problems or, f or failing to solve them, just being indignant about them. She was, and some of her causes, as I, you know, came to know them, were, were marvelous. She was devoted to the Queensboro Public Library, and she got onto the, eventually got onto the board of the Queensboro Public Library, um, which I didn't do with my character. I just have it glanced at, but my, my grandmother actually served on this board where everyone else was basically like a, a hack politician or a, a, a local uh, priest or judge who'd kind of been given this honorific, and she got on there as a local advocate for her branch, and had, she just had become so impossible and so um, involved that they, it's like they tried to kick her upstairs. And so she discovered how immovable this bureaucracy was from the inside and was deeply betrayed by this. But in the process leading up to that, she'd basically done so much volunteer work and insisted that so much support be drawn out of her neighborhood, her community in, in Queens, that I think the local library still shows the marks of her efforts. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of great. But it's also very non, it's like doesn't connect to any theory or ideology or principles, just like libraries were this golden principle to her. Well, okay, I could kind of connect that. She loved books. She loved literacy. She was obsessed with language with, you know, one of the reasons I don't have like a Brooklyn accent is it was not permissible that I could, mm -hmm. I could, I could sound that way. And my, my mother before me had had her Queens accent, you know, 
there were elocution lessons and it was just like, you're going to be literate. And, and so there was this enormous valorization of literacy and the book and it seemed to me a lot of energy transferred out of um, other areas into this obsession. Um, and, and then there were local feuds and much more kind of n gnomic, problematic, you know, like there, there were bad people in her neighborhood. There were people who just weren't right. And sometimes she would claim to have discovered that they were, uh, you know, racists in some way. Or, but it was also, it was obviously just she was uh, an impossible person. Yeah. <laughs> and had feuds with all her neighbors. Yeah. And, and it was, everything was a like quilt of of uh, catastrophic, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, broken um, uh, alliances. And, and, you know, I actually, I wrote about her before I wrote about her, and I disguised it totally. In, uh, in Motherless Brooklyn, in my, 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 my fifth novel, when I first wanted to really write about New York City, I basically, Frank Minna, uh, for those of you who know this book or, or can remember it if you, if you read it, He's the there's, guy who runs the there's car There's the guy service. who runs yeah. Carroll Gardens. Yeah. He's the, like the local fixer, and he, he walks Court Street going in and out of every business, and he has weird, you know, to the boys who are saddled with this uh, job of being his errand boys, everything seems like a, a weird map of alliances and secret influences, and he's, he's always grabbing a little money here or, or saying, oh, don't talk to those people. Well, that's my grandmother, really. Mm -hmm. And I even, in, I mean, her name was Minna Frank, so I just inverted, I just turned her into... <laughs> and it, that, I'll tell you, I'll tell, the, I'll tell this story. It comes from a joke of hers. Uh, she, her name, so her name was Minna Frank, and she used to um, always fill out forms, you know, in New York City, you fill out a lot of forms if you're, if you're sending your kids to public schools or if you're going to uh, get, you know, um, free glasses from the Department of Health and Human Services or whatever you're doing if you're, if you're growing up in that era, you know, the, the LaGuardia era, everything was a bureaucracy. And um, she would fill them out properly, last name first, you know, first name last, last name first. And the person who would read it back when she was in the waiting room, would always think that she was one of the typical people who'd failed to understand it. So they would say, uh, Mr. Minna, Mr. Frank Minna, and Mr. Minna, and she would always, she had this line that she would go up to the window and she would say, that's not a, uh, that's not a misdemeanor, that's a felony. <laughs> but this was such a, a running joke in, in, in her life that she also, I think my, my, my mother got sick of hearing this story. <laughs> Mr. Minna, Mr. Minna. So one day, and you know, my grandmother was this, you know, titanically charismatic, intense single woman for a very, very long time. Now, we'll get into her sex life or whatever those mysteries are later, but I think my, my mother was always goading her to try to, you know, solve her, her loneliness. And so one day my mother said, you know, somewhere there, there must be a, a Frank Minna and you've got to find this guy. <laughs> and so they, they flipped open the Queen's phone book and there actually was a Frank, a, a Frank Minna. My grandmother's name exactly reversed as she'd been called by these people calling out her name on these forms all the time. So right there on the spot with my mother there, my grandmother called Frank Minna <laughs> and proposed marriage blind. <laughs> But he was, he was already married. Um, but that, that itself inserted itself into a scene in, um, in Motherless Brooklyn where Lionel Esrog looks in the phone book. Someone says, why don't you see if there's another Esrog? Yeah. And that's, that's what he does. Yeah. But so this way of dwelling on, on the, the, the grid of Sunnyside, you know, Greenpoint Avenue, every encounter was charged. That became uh, Motherless Brooklyn. That became Frank Minna. And... These mysteries, this dark area, what is, what's, what's going on? What's wrong? Why is my grandmother so worked up? Can't she talk about? Mm. What, what's the problem that's being avoided? The one clue I had was that my uncle Fred was always taunting her at family picnics about something she'd gotten wrong in 1956. And she would just get angrier and angrier as Uncle Fred needled her about this mysterious error. Well, that error was Stalinism, right? Yeah. She'd been hung out to dry by the Khrushchev revelations in 1956, mm -hmm. and she was still pissed, and Fr Uncle Fred still knew he could get her yeah. to, you know, on that point. So this is all I knew. 
Um, and, and I just wanted to write about this mystery of yeah. what could be, what could make you angry in 1956 that, that everything shaped itself around for the rest of your life. Now, the other major character in the book, in my mind, is Miriam, who is yeah. Rose's daughter. And before we get too little carried away, um, you have a, sel a so read, yeah. selection to read mm -hmm. from the book. We, and, and this is Miriam taking a protege of her mother's into a chess shop in, in, in Greenwich Village because they're, they're, they're trying to help this kid get out of Queens, basically. Right, yeah. yeah. Right. So Laura was just, just uh, saying, and I'll, 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 I'll nail it down a little more. So the grandmother character we were just alluding to is Rose. Rose Zimmer is her last name in the book. And her daughter is now named Miriam Gogan because she's married this Irish folk singer. And um, Miriam propelled herself out of Queens by precisely by marrying into the, you know, kind of lower orders of folk royalty in Greenwich Village. You know, she was hanging out on McDougal Street and she, she, she graduated herself from, from Queens and became a, a Manhattanite by, by becoming part of the folk scene. And this is 1969. Now, uh, Rose has partly filled this vacuum in her life by semi-adopting this black policeman's kid, who in this chapter in 1969 is 13 years old. And his name is Cicero Lookins. And, you know, much as my grandmother dragged me around uh, Sunnyside, um, Rose, the grandmother, has been dragging Cicero, this, this black kid, around Sunnyside and taking him to the library and educating him in her idea of, 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 um, of culture. And this is a scene where Miriam decides to leap in. So the daughter is kind of grabbing hold of Cicero and saying, you know, Rose is not the only thing out there. And I'm not going to get very far into the scene, but I'll, I'll read a little bit. When he was 13 years old, Cicero Lookins was told for the first and only time that Rose Zimmer had once shoved her daughter's head into an oven. Miriam Gogan told him this one cool November afternoon, a day unforgettable in any number of arresting specifics. It began with chess. Cicero had lately been savaging all comers at IS 125's chess club, so Miriam, on Rose's council, had proposed to bring him to call on Cousin Lenny at the chess store on McDougal, there to play and have measured whether he might be a prodigy, a wunderkind. Afterwards, Miriam promised she'd shepherd Cicero to a loft on Grand Street to have his astrological chart professionally drawn for him. So this would be a day of futures foretold. Though thanks to Rose and Cicero's father's improbably durable affair, Rose is sleeping with the black cop whose son Cicero is, though thanks to the Rose and Cicero's father's improbably durable affair, she might be considered Cicero's de facto older sister, Miriam had artfully ignored Cicero until sweeping him up this day. She'd come and seized him from Rose's apartment, from Rose's grip, and with very little ceremony in the exchange, as though it were graduation day. Miriam, in her flyaway hair and long houndstooth coat, hypnotic pattern of the black and white squares like some devilishly blurred chessboard, but one you couldn't play on, couldn't see in its entirety at once because it wrapped around her. Cicero should have known at that moment that Miriam was here to foster revolution in him, to demonstrate that the chessboard, like the world, wasn't flat but round. Cicero had been, to that point, Rose's Negro boy. So, Cicero supposed, Miriam planned now to put some check on that dynamic, to insert in Cicero's mind a little healthy skepticism as to Rose's high ideals. Cicero's obedient silences would have suggested the need for such intervention. Outwardly, he was obedient in the extreme. In point of fact, Cicero at 13 was already a monster of skepticism. Yet he believed in chess. Chess was a secret garden of rational absolutes, on the squares, things swooped or swerved according to their hard and fast scripts. Bishops and rooks thus, pawns durably plodding, black and white, unmistakable foes. Knights, like Cicero himself, had some secrets. They played at brazen invisibility, at walking through walls. 
Apparently looking in one direction, knights killed you in a side glance from another. If you employed them just so, all other pieces seemed earth-mired, sluggish as pawns. To that day, Cicero had been tempted to believe that if you got good enough at a first thing, you might never need to master a second. Cicero believed in chess, and so, though Miriam interested him as a fellow endurer of rows, one with an advantage of years, when Miriam escorted Cicero into the tiny chess store, he forgot about both women. The store, air mucked with pipe smoke, smeared glass cabinets exhibiting exotic sets, and in the ice cold mezzanine, the gray obsessive figures, barely human, their coats not even shed, hunched over gnarled end games. The pale twitchy hands that darted forth from sleeves to clop the wooden pieces forcefully to new squares and flicked out to punch the dull brass button on the time clocks those hands might have had a life of their own, no relation to the rolling eyes and bunching brows and pursing lips above. You might have no idea, looking only at the faces, which of them was connected to the hands that had made the moves. This might be Cicero's first glimpse, really, of an authentically academic setting, the destination towards which his life was pitched. A miniaturized world craven with self-regard, unimpressive except to those who read the palace codes, and sublimely oblivious to the outside. And Cicero was here not only to meet, at last, crazy cousin Lenny, who'd played Bobby Fischer once, he was here to play him. Lennon Angrish bustled upstairs a moment after. Cousin Lenny's given name is Lennon. <laughs> Lennon Angrish bustled upstairs a moment after. A glass of tea, he said before greeting Miriam, slapping his palm in mock outrage on the small counter where the proprietor only lifted his eyebrows slightly. Then the bearded fist of Cousin Lenny's face unclenched, his smile revealing a trace relation to Rose in the gap of his teeth. Bubala! He clutched Miriam in her houndstooth coat, her purse trapped in his embrace, his limbs encasing her like a sausage. Then released her to the vigilance of his gaze, which mingled scorn, worship, and guilt. The black hair everywhere on his head was clipped to a weirdly identical length. His fuller brushes of eyebrows, his lip smothering beard, the hair on the top the same as that shooting from around his ears, as though he'd been mowed. <laughs> his, spinal, his spinal curvature tended towards the rabbinical, his eyes toward the heretic. That beneath his stinking black coat he wore some insignias of the hippie, a worn thin Woodstock t-shirt, bird perched on guitar's neck, a frayed woven sash of rainbow wool for a belt, did nothing to counter the impression of a figure heaved painfully and against steep odds into the present, out of the rank and degraded past. Miriam's own outfit, once her coat was at last loosened, struck Cicero as a kind of costume rather than ingenuous clothing, a yellow silk-screened Groucho Marx t-shirt worn braless beneath her white denim jacket, peace sign earrings, and tiny purple-tinted John Lennon shades. Cicero sometimes wondered, were hippies serious? <laughs> anyway, Cousin Lenny clocked her nipples like a hypnotist's pocket watch, a distraction that ought to provide Cicero with an advantage in the coming chess match. Really, though, cousin? <laughs> a horny, tragic uncle. That's what Cicero thought now, as he stood with his fists dug into the pocket of his Tom Seaver Mets warm-up jacket, staring. Rose had implied Lenny was Miriam's contemporary, but he seemed 20 years older, at least. Lenny still hadn't glanced at Cicero, so far as Cicero could tell. When he did, Cicero felt caught, lulled into making a move, as though Lennon Angrish had only been a movie projected on a screen, not a person who could look back. So why, said Cousin Lenny, why did no one mention that the Black Fisher was a man mountain? Cicero was, at 13, already accustomed to being presented by Rose to those who'd shamelessly exclaim over him. There were only so many things they could exclaim. He was ready for Man Mountain, ready for black. He picked out only what interested him. You really had a match with Fisher? He asked Cousin Lenny. One game, a draw. Lenny's boiling eyes consulted Miriam's. You told him? I'm sure you can imagine that it was Rose who mentioned Fisher, said Miriam. I'll let you explain it. Under a tented canopy, Lenny began, Fisher against 20 at once. Opponents seated, him stalking among us, glancing at the boards, selecting his moves carelessly. 
like a man brushing ants from a picnic table. That's how the captured pieces flew. He savaged us. I think he forgot a pawn on my board. Maybe something got stuck in his eye. Who knows? It was a windy day. I was the last alive, my position tenable. Yet when he turned full attention to me, I deposited a small portion of diarrhea into my pants. <laughs> I offered a draw and he took it. Who knows? Maybe in his contract it said he shouldn't have humiliated every last man, but rather leave one figure of identification for the common rabble to root for. Maybe he just wanted to be done with it. Maybe he wanted a sandwich. In any event, I and my shitted Fruit of the Looms recorded a drawn match against Bobby Fischer, Coney Island, May 1964. The room full of players deferred to Lenny, whether out of respect or wearied aggravation, you couldn't say. A table was cleared by the window overlooking McDougal Street. The glass of tea placed in Lenny's hands. Play white, he commanded Cicero, seating himself at the black pieces. He doesn't need to be indulged, said Miriam. I'm not indulging, believe me, said Lenny. I want to see his attacking game. If he doesn't have one, he's nowhere. I can see by his outfit he's a front runner. He likes winners, so let him show me he knows how to win. I have to explain this. In 1969, the Mets actually won the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> it will happen in our lifetimes again, like the revolution. <laughs> If you want to understand my cousin Lenny, Miriam explained, begin with the fact that he's the one human occupant of Queens who couldn't allow himself to enjoy the miracle Mets. Ha, said Lenny, the Mets are the opiate of the masses. Make, make her tell you, kid, make her tell you how your team represents the abortion of socialist baseball in America. <laughs> Lenny knew Bill Shea, Miriam explained. Shea, like the stadium, the guy who brought the Mets. Lenny had another idea. Never speak that running dog's name aloud, <laughs> said Lenny. Have her tell you when I'm out of hearing distance. The death of the Sunnyside proletarians. <laughs> it's a, a team that Lenny has proposed. <laughs> the death of the Sunnyside proletarians. Your team's a crime scene, kid. No hard feelings. <laughs> Play chess, said Miriam, unless you're afraid of him. He's playing white, Mim. I await the Wunderkind's debut. Miriam stole one of the bentwood chairs from another table and placed herself beside Cicero, as if she'd be playing for his side. Cicero pushed King's pawn. He needed to pee, said nothing. Lenny, grunting, unhooked a forefinger from his ear long enough to shove a pawn to mirror Cicero's. Then out flopped knights. Cicero centered himself within this veil of discomfort and disgust on the possible actions of the pieces while the large second story window steamed with pipe smoke exhalations, burps, and farts. Miriam, not watching the board, waved at the street below, apparently someone she knew, a musician kicking along with a giant case containing either an upright bass or a million dollars worth of hash hashish. Outside the world had colors. Outside the world had colors and likely sounds other than the lung rattle of opponents not yet informed of their deaths at some earlier date, possibly in the late 1950s. The interior of the chess shop apart from Cousin Lenny's improbable sash, was in black and white. Outside 1970 was more than a possibility. It was a likelihood just weeks away. In here, rumors of Sputnik might still have been rash. The present was a gelled substance, like hair pomade, bottled behind this glass. Cicero couldn't navigate it with his knights. In fact, Cousin Lenny now shocked him by trapping one and removing it from the board. You're going to lose this game, said Lenny. You like coins, kid? I never thought about them, said Cicero. You should discover coins. <laughs> Numismatics presents a world of fascination and value, because <laughs> frankly, this is going nowhere for you. <laughs> play the game, Lenny, said Miriam. I can talk and play, said Lenny, especially play your protege here. He's got no attack to speak of. You know this after six moves? You're not even watching, Miriam. We've played 16. I've seen enough. You're a civilian, so you want to see bloodshed. If you demand that I checkmate him, I'll do it for you, but the kid's smart enough to resign already. Cicero glanced at Miriam, then back at the board. If he didn't study Lenny's decrepitude, only listened to them flicking insults, he could believe they were cousins. Lenny paid as little attention as Miriam. Cicero was left alone to study the position of the pieces, unless you counted the steady gaze, amused and skeptical, of Groucho Marx from Miriam's T-shirt. Cicero thought he still had a prayer, he noticed a seam of vulnerability for his surviving knight to explore. 
But advancing the night in this cause, he felt an instantaneous knowledge, spreading like a blush of shame across his whole front, that Lenny had been waiting for him. Had, Lenny had been waiting for him to overreach this last and fatal time. No sooner had the piece landed than Lenny's hand flicked out to push the bishop's pawn a square forward, inflicting on Cicero's ranks three simultaneous disasters. They both knew it. The question was who'd inform Miriam? Likely you have a terrific defensive game, said Cousin Lenny. His red, hoary fingertips and weird, nubby thumbs scrabbed at scrabbled at remote outposts in his beard. You flop the pieces from side to side, letting an adversary defeat himself. Playing impatient 13-year-olds, this is a good strategy. You prefer black, don't you? I spotted this when I first laid eyes on you. Incredibly, Cousin Lenny seemed to include no innuendo or shame in this remark, but meant it as a cold statement of fact. It was one. Cicero preferred black. He nodded. Of course you do, said Lenny. As it happens, this is how I stayed in against Fisher. I circled my wagons. I bored him to death. You think you've been playing chess, but you've been playing your opponents, kid, not the pieces. Miriam, this child is a prodigious listener, a watcher of his fellow human animals. I'd be terrified of what information he's gathered on you to this point, as I'm already terrified of, of him myself. If we can ascertain his sympathies, he may prove highly useful to the cause of the workers' revolution, but he'll go nowhere in chess. <laughs> Now, Mim, tell me, when are you leaving your goyish singer so that we can commence the life for which we were intended? He must be losing his looks by now, and in this I have the advantage, having had no looks to begin with. <laughs> the day you quit jerking off, Lenny, is the day I leave him, said Miriam. You know I've always promised this, but remember I can see into your bedroom. Lenny put his hands over the Woodstock bird and his own heart. Then he cupped the fingers of his right hand, placed them lower down, and shook them as if they held a pair of dice. You who've robbed me of my heart's desire since the day you sprouted a bosom, you'll take even this from me? <laughs> Discipline, Lenny. He shrugged, arched his fuller brushes, beckoned heaven with an upraised palm, evoking the full worldliness of a Yiddish stage ham's rendition of Hamlet or Oedipus. Then I'll have to jerk in the foyer where you can't see me. <laughs> Miriam flipped him the bird. We've got a date with an astrologer, Lenny. I'll see you another time. Wait! With the same hand that had phantom jerked, Lenny now horrifyingly dug in his pants pocket. Here, he pressed something cool into Cicero's hand, a zinc U.S. penny, Rose's almighty Lincoln, rendered in tinfoil. Cousin Lenny lowered his voice. Study that coin. If you persist, you'll find, it, you'll find in it the whole secret law of history. The death of the United States of America rests there in your hand, kid. You can, whisper to it. you can listen to it whisper if you hold your head close. I need to use the restroom, said Cicero. Miriam took Cicero downstairs to the toilet and then out of the chess shop, that library of souls, that grave of time. Onto the sidewalks of Greenwich Village where 1969 was permitted to reassert itself, resume its animation and flow. Though, 1969 was as much a confabulation, surely, as that thickened portion of time trapped behind the chess mezzanine's window. The present, nevertheless, had the advantage of being still open to negotiation. Cicero had heard that all sorts of people lived in Greenwich Village. The 13-year-old secret faggot was ready to meet them. Miriam said, I hope you weren't scandalized by that jackass. Cicero said nothing. Did scandalize include how? in the chess shop's tragic, minuscule restroom, his dick was surprisingly hard before he drained it? Crummy, scummy cousin Lenny? Could Lenny have been a subject for Cicero's fixations? Maybe it was just the matter-of-fact mimicry Lenny had performed with his hand. Maybe it was the way he'd wrenched Cicero from his hiding place of chess, reinstalling him in the perplexity of the adult world. He'll go nowhere in chess. That was the phrase Lennon Angrish used in an action with a result as sudden as pressing a James Bond ejection seat button. Cicero knew plenty of nowhere on Queens Boulevard, on Skillman or Jackson or Greenpoint Avenues, in Rose's company or surrounded by streaming school children or alone, which added up to the same thing. Nowhere, nothing, no how. Cicero was still at home only in himself. There, barely. To Lenny's verdict, Cicero now added a vow. Black pieces or white, he'd never touch chessmen again. 
He fingered the zinc penny deep in his pocket. American money was a lie. The Mets, a crime scene. Lenny thrilled Cicero by his allusions to secret knowledge, history as a drama of lies. Perhaps it was this that had bestowed Cicero's hard on. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Miriam, mm -hmm. who um, I think her, the, this Irish folk singer, uh, Tommy, that she ends up marrying, uh, thinks of her as the spirit creature of New York City. Um, I think she was inspired by her own mother, clearly, yeah. um, who also is manifested in Fortress of Solitude. Mm -hmm. um, uh, talk a little bit about um, what it was like to, uh, I, I think one of the really impressive aspects of this book is is the way that the relationship between Rose and Miriam is sort of this an unbreakable bond full of hatred and this strange form of love and they talk on the phone almost every day, it seems like. Yeah. Um, but yet Miriam wants to get away from her. I mean, it, it's just a, you're writing about a particular kind of relationship, a mother-daughter relationship that, um, that you haven't participated in yourself, obviously, and yet it is really the the kind of the 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 nuclear core mm -hmm. of of the novel in yeah. a way. I'm glad you say that. I feel like that space between them is the center of the book. I mean, it, you could claim it's funny you were saying that you think Miriam is the other main character, and there are sort of four or five main characters in the book, but the um, more than anything, the center of the book is this space between Miriam and Rose. The emotional structure and the political implications <laughs> of this transfer from uh, one version of American dissidence, you know, or, uh, um, you know, being at odds with the, the culture at large to another. Um, and, yeah, it's an area of, of real mystery to me that I, you know, am just pouring as much attention onto as I can. Um, parts of my personal history, but also things that I've experienced, uh, you know, um, in other people's lives, or, you know, uh, Vivian Gornick's great memoir about her mother uh, was a real it's called energy fierce source, attachment. fierce attachments. Yeah. Um, and I also became a parent in the time just as I was conceiving this book and beginning to write it. And, you know, this mystery of, um, you know, this incredibly tender, intimate, totally dependent life you have with a baby and then realizing that they might feel about you one day the way you feel about <laughs> your, your parents. They might, they might <laughs> denounce you, <laughs> which is, you know, I, I, and then again, they might live long enough to, you know, uh, put a full reverse on denouncing you. That all of this is encompassed in these relationships. And so I just, um, uh, pour, like I say, I poured as much of my own yearning and, and, uh, and, and um, confusion into that space as I could. Um, I mean, I think that I also was writing about you know, obviously to get to Miriam's feelings about Rose, I used my own direct feelings about my grandmother, who I kind of couldn't get away from fast enough and was always uh, transfixed by and, and um, you know, there was this immense power that she had over me and, and, and influence. Um, so, uh, what was the question? <laughs> well, I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to know a little bit about what yeah. it was like to write about a mother-daughter relationship, yeah. partly because y you really, you're really imagining yourself yeah. into one of the sort of fundamental relationships of human yeah. kind, and right. yet it, it is your, well, you're uh, a, a I mean, dis an outsider to that. I'll, I'll say this, that I, um, I've always thought, I mean, you're asking me a version of the gender question. How yeah. do you do, how do you do, if, you know, which is a question that I've, uh, I've, 
been in the grip of for myself, just uh, as a writer, since I wanted to write about uh, the adolescent girl in, in Girl and Landscape. And the, the truth of my solution to that is that uh, the character has to be so real to you that it, gender melts away, that their reality is overwhelming to you in a way that's just persuasive and eradicates those questions. And this same answer applies to my attempt to do the Irish background of the Irish folk singer. I just have to b believe in the, the voice, the, the brain voice, it's David Foster Wallace's great term, of the character and, um, and, and give myself to that. And, um, and then, yeah, you collect details anywhere. You know, uh, there's the magpie aspect to being a novelist. I've, I, I, I read a hundred memoirs. Uh, mm. uh, you know, not all of them um, uh, books I didn't, I'd recommend. Uh, but, you know, mothers and daughters became very important to me. <laughs> or an, a, important to me to, to Trans, do a transmigration with, you know, I mean, they were already important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you see, you know, there, there are two different generations, you know, in addition to mother and daughter, biologically, there are two different generations of this kind of dissident spirit. Yeah. And um, it's sort of catastrophic for both of them in yeah. a way, although it doesn't seem so for Miriam for a lot of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess I'm, I'm fascinated, and this is just outside of politics for me, really. It's, it's something that I, I, I'm just thinking about as I walk around uh, trying to navigate daily life. Um, I, you know, I forget New York or communism or my own family history, but just uh, our, our compulsion to, free, to freedom and, our, and, and what a... Uh, how, how hypocritical and paradoxical our relationship to real freedom is whenever, whenever we glimpse it or attain it. Mm -hmm. That we sort of live with it as an emblem and, um, and, and run screaming from the real implications. And so that's, I think, really, you know, um, for, for Rose and Miriam, they both uh, achieve it and, and are, are completely undone by the extent to which they, they liberate themselves. You know, I mean, for, for Rose, sometime in her early life, before the book begins, she, or it, the book barely glances at this, but she throws off the Jewish God. And then she spends the rest of her life tormented by what she sacrificed in making that intellectual, uh, you know, pole vault <laughs> out of her family's belief and her family's traditions into the outer space of secular uh, thinking. And then in Miriam's generation, uh, that work is sort of a given. That's her legacy. She, she gets to start from that and move into uh, ideas of, of kind of personal freedom, the, the typical ones that were being explored in the 60s and 70s. And um, the, you know, ideological left collapsed, but the personal left suddenly exploded, and it, had, it was baited with all the same kinds of, um, you know, uh, tormenting possibilities for, for, um, for uh, transforming your life through your yearning for freedom and, and, and paying prices. All kinds of prices. Now, as the, I, I have to ask because I don't know. Do you see Miriam as the spirit creature of New York City? Well, I I, I know I must flirt with that. You know, I mean, I think that there's a joke very late in the book where uh, Cicero. Uh, you know, we're talking about now about characters that you guys haven't encountered at all. But Cicero, who grows up, the 13 year old, grows into a very imperious and kind of mean. Uh, judgmental character in certain ways, and he sees this other character um, falling in love, basically, or anyway, having a, a big crush on a woman who suddenly appears, and he makes a joke about the manic pixie dream girl. He <laughs> yeah. calls it his Marxist pixie dream girl. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I think in writing about Miriam, I wanted to write about the problem of 
enchanting people that way mm. for a woman. What it, what it does to your life in more than a passing moment to seem to be a muse, a muse of freedom or a muse of inspiration or a muse of possibility, of daring, and, and also an emblem of a place. I, you know, I will be your entree into Greenwich Village. I, I will be your passport into uh, Jews. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you all the funny stuff about what it's really like. But yeah. there's a cost to being enchanting yeah. that Miriam struggles with. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and I hope it did to you, even if you haven't <laughs> read the book. I realize we started to get into the tall grass a bit. Um, we're ready for some questions now. Great. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, Oh, okay, this is a this is a great question. Did you move the location of this novel to Queens because the Brooklyn of your earlier novels no longer exists? Yeah, well, that's great. Um, well, I mean, I do think that um, I uh, well, let me let me talk about the Brooklyn of my earlier novels. You know, I've come to see that um, <laughs> Brooklyn's changed again. There's like a, a, there's a passage that this place went through that I'm like a deep witness to. And I kind of testified. And I, and I didn't just do that out of my own powers. I drew on uh, other witnesses. You know, my, my, my friends my age and my brother, uh, you know, very specifically uh, a, a group of buddies who kind of helped me think about the stuff that went into Fortress of Solitude. And it book is such a legacy book and such a piece of, I mean, among the other things it tries to do, it's kind of a, a piece of deliberate collective witnessing by my brother and my friend Carl and my friend Dione and a few others. Um, uh, I could run off their names just to satisfy myself. Jeremy, Joel, Alexander. <laughs> uh, the, the boys of Borum Hill. And I couldn't claim to have a grip on what's happened next. I'm amazed and, and perplexed by it, and I think it probably deserves as much contemplation as I offered. But in a way, I set a standard for myself I could never satisfy again. And I think that I'll have to do Brooklyn from different angles if I do it again. So I, I also think that, you know, when, when um, when I, I'll, I'm going to make a weird analogy. When, when Marvel Comics invited me to write a comic book, they, uh, they wanted to please me. They said, you could write about the Fantastic Four or Spider-Man. And instead, I picked this dingy character who only lasted for 10 issues and no one remembered, called Omega the Unknown, because there just weren't, you know, I felt there were too many stories about Spider-Man. I couldn't make him my own. And I think Brooklyn, right after I... Uh, struck the vein in those two books, Brooklyn became overdetermined in a way that's prob it's a problem. Mm. It's, a, it's just a problem, uh, you know, in the most simple sense that Spider-Man is a problem. You can't think about him <laughs> because he's too, he's too many things, he's been too many things. He's, yeah. he's like a toothbrush and, and a Band-Aid as well as a character, you know. And <laughs> I guess I'm, I guess I'm, uh, I wanna write about Brooklyn again and I'm really uncertain how to carve out a space where I can do it uh, and feel as satisfied as I did with those earlier books. So Queens suddenly, because of my relationship to Sunnyside and my grandmother, seemed a way to do outer borough identity again and to do the street again and um, do this charged doubleness, this relationship to Manhattan again. So it was very personal, but it was transposed. Yeah. And it so was very handy words, that way. Yeah. Your answer to Bob of Brooklyn is yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bob, yeah. got your answer. Um, you said in a previous interview that you started this work to explore your grandmother's sex life. <laughs> what on earth ever prompted you to think about the sex life of your family members and also um, why did you call it 
make the drug from gun with occasional music? Oh, very different question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just two questions there. Um, the first one might, the second one seems like it might be a little bit easier. Why did you call it make? I can't remember. Yeah. It's so easy. That's so um, but that was, I wrote that, I started that book when I was 22. And I'm turning 50 next year. So I can't remember that decision. Um, I mean, I think I thought it was funny to call a place where you picked up your drugs a makery. So it might have been a back formation from the makery, which sounded like a bakery. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, okay, now, but why, why did you want to explore? Well, healthy? I think I want to back away, first of all, and, and because it's a kind of, when did you stop beating your, uh, <laughs> beating your wife question. I don't walk around thinking about the sex lives of my family members all the time. <laughs> But, I mean, when I describe my grandmother's life as consisting of this sort of like a, 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 a lot of unanswerable questions, mm. there's, a, you know, for a, a person who's writing a history book or a family memoir, not knowing is a problem. And you have to either solve it through diligent research or lie or not write the book. But for a novelist, not knowing is this tremendously powerful invitation. And... I just, um, I, I'm beautifully without access. You know, my grandmother's been gone a long time. My father, who's not by temperament a, uh, a remarkable uh, oral historian of family histories, he's just, it's not his great strength. He'll answer questions if I come up with them, and sometimes he has some fragmentary answers. But he, like I said to him, okay, was she a member of a, of a communist Cell, and he said, I, I just don't know. I really don't know. And that became my chance to write about uh, this fact that is true, but I don't know if it's true for me that lots of people's family lives include this, and to make it up and s throw all this force of yearning and speculation and fascination into this unknown territory of my grandmother's political life. Well, her sexual and romantic life was similar. She was a really dynamic and a really attractive woman who, whose husband left her in 1948 with a three-year-old child. And she was still dynamic and attractive in the 70s. Now, I think she had boyfriends of some kind, but I think probably they were also never prospects for, you know, they were married men or they were impossible men or they, I don't know. So it was a thing to throw all of my novelistic instincts at because she was so real to me and I knew something real must exist but I could never find it out. I had no route back to that f factual stuff. So instead I could take what I felt, what the, the glimmers that were inside me just as a child around her that she had not stopped having a sexual self in 1940, whatever it was, but that, you know, of course there was something and I just was gonna let that be my occasion for this book, partly. Um, is your novel on some level a lament f of political apathy today? Yeah, on some level. I mean, I, I didn't conceive it as a, um, a, a, any direct message or any conclusive thought. I, I wanted to just evoke all the confusion and yearning that I, that I feel was my legacy and I embody in the present. You know, like the, the power of the experience of being in a, um, a family of protesters how much it mattered to me and how few avenues uh, of satisfaction it ever involved. It was always something that, uh, that, that um, was thwarted or, or unfinished or, or you, know, didn't, you know, we didn't get this and we didn't make that and, and Reaganism changed everything that we thought we were about to have. And, um, and I began, as I learned more and grew up and thought about where those feelings in me came from. They weren't just from uh, marching around a lot in the 70s um, and then going off to college and trying to forget about it all or being embarrassed about it all. They were also about the lives my mother 
and grandmother and father had lived, where they'd embodied unfinished or incomplete yearnings for transformation. And it, it was an emotion and a sensation that I wanted to just fill in with understanding. But I, and, or just depiction. I wanted to just uh, make it really tangible um, without saying a definite thing. Now, a really, a really definite thing happened in the middle of my writing of this book, Occupy, occurred. And I'm so um, easily swept up that a crazy part of me, but really real, and I really remember it, I remember the day I thought, oh my God, does my book have a happy ending? <laughs> you know, the streets were full of people. <laughs> and I just didn't know what it meant, but it, I knew it meant a lot to me. Mm. And I didn't know where it was going, but um, I did know I was going to have to describe that as well. And so I became, there was like a, the track of the enterprise I'd begun, and there was the track of clocking my own minute-by-minute minute feelings about a story that was just pronouncing itself that was going to have to be reflected in the work, too, um, which was lucky in the end. It was quite confusing for a while. Um, but, I mean, because it seems to me the paradoxes, the, the self-defeats and the triumphs are all replicate in such amazing ways earlier um, moments. Uh, they evoke them anyway. Um. There's, this is two questions, and they're both pretty good, so um, I'm going to ask them both. Um, which character from your books do you most identify with? Uh, I, I'm, I'm so glad someone asked that, um, because I, I feel like I'm always um, stuck with the given book. Mm -hmm. You know, the question's always, uh, you know, now it'll be maybe when it comes up, it will come up. Oh, are, you, are you Cicero or are you Sergius? Because I can see, you know, one is like a a middle-aged college professor, that's you now. The other is like the grandson of this red family. And you know, you're not uh, black and gay, but you're also not kind of that weird folk singing loser. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and, and I'm always, of course, the truth is I'm always in like a hologram between the characters. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of me is in Miriam too. And in fact, I drew on myself to make Rose at times. Um, but even more, since you put it in terms of my books overall, was why the question seems like a really nice invitation to me. Um, I always thought that if, you, you know, if I didn't exist or you couldn't get to know me, that the best hologram, the closest hologram, would be the two characters that I first had to answer this question about all the time. Um, Dylan Abdus from The Fortress of Solitude is all the most defeated parts of, of my persona. The, the, the reticence and the, the, the regret and the pain, you know, completely unamplified by what I'd like to think of as my more fun and connected self. And then Lionel Esrog, who is much more lovable than I would ever, could ever be on Earth, the, the character from Motherless Brooklyn, if you kind of found an exact midpoint between Dylan Ebdus and Lionel Esrog, you'd kind of, I, I would like to think I'm kind of right there. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, if you were to cheat on New York with another city, which city would it be? <laughs> well, I, um, I've, you know, I've gone at California in weird ways. I started there, and I wrote about it, uh, the Bay Area in a couple of books early on, but in a kind of uh, cartoonish way. The, the Bay Area of those early books is sort of used as a, like a funny f um, primary color backdrop for, for, for um, the action of the books. And then I, um, I did this even stranger leap where I wrote about Los Angeles before I'd ever lived there in You Don't Love Me Yet. And again, it was done as a way, actually as a way out of the problem of place. I wanted to write about a place without authority, without a legacy, without, you know, um, the sense of, um, in, of uh, being implicated so deeply. I'm now uh, beginning to write about Maine a little bit. I think that it's not a city, but actually the place 
that's entering my work is this part of uh, the country that I've been going to all my life, but more and more spending time there, um, coastal Maine. And it's actually in this book yeah. a good bit. Um, but I don't know that I could ever do another city and have it uh, a, a present, you know, uh, I, couldn't, I don't think I could do the New York, the, thing, the things I do in, in the New York setting. Uh, this person could mean not just writing about a city, just but sort of oh, being in love with a city. Where would I, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't know. You know, I Maybe like a lot of I like a lot of places, but um, but I but I I'm I'm terribly hidebound by my uh, you know deep relationship to to New York. Other places are other than New York. You know, when I'm like mm -hmm. in Ann Arbor, Michigan, I think it's great, but I'm comparing it to oh, it's like oh, there's like a good deli and then nice people. <laughs> This is good. I can do this. It's distance from New York. It's just all measured. I'm, I'm way too uh, stuck here, yeah. I think, you know. Okay. Um, what themes in your, two th uh, uh, your 2013 world intrigue you now to pursue? I, I assume you mean in, in, in fiction, or it could be in nonfiction mm -hmm. as well. What themes in my 2013 world? Well, I'm very slow to figure out what I'm interested in. I mean, I'm not like a, a, a journalist. I don't... I don't capture uh, present reality, uh, I'm, I'm usually sunk deep in the past. You know, and I, so I think, you know, one reason that I was so awkward answering that previous question is, you know, may, I'm living right now in a, in a sort of a, on the edge of Los Angeles. And if I lived there for like 20 years, maybe suddenly it would be enormous and be a big feature of my work, but I don't know. Things sink in so slowly. Uh, you know, I'm writing about my grandmother. I'm constantly thinking about 1972. Uh, and so I don't know what parts of my present life are likely to sink in that way, except, of course, that I'm so preoccupied with being a parent right now. Mm. So I could guess that that's, you know, it's, it's probably going to become increasingly Im important to my writing because it's so important to my yeah. my. There's a certain way that about life. being a parent is about being in a house so much. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm I'm in a I'm I'm in a home life yeah. in a different way. Yeah. Rather than a city. Um that's the last been. of our questions. Yeah. So uh I want to thank Jonathan. Thank you, Laura. And thank all of you for coming. Yeah.